What the World is Coming To. It's a subtle title in the sense that it's slightly different from the exclamation of despair. What is the world coming to? It's a phrase I've heard recently from several of my work colleagues where they have seen dramatic things appearing in the earth and people are starting to wonder what's happening. There seems a, a strange uh, momentum in terms of the events that are happening in the earth. And we're familiar with them, aren't we? The prospect of refugees fleeing hostility and war, looking for a better life in the West. The controversial topic of climate change, violence, substance abuse, crime, famine. It seems that man is having to deal with a whole series of problems that are amassing and demanding his attention. Financial collapse, civil unrest, oppression, injustice, corruption. We're familiar with all these things, aren't we? What is the world coming to? Well, we as Christadelphians believe that the Bible delivers an answer to that question, that it says what the world is coming to, and that is the kingdom of God to be established upon the earth. The disciples asked the Lord Jesus, well, Lord, how should we pray? And so he gives them what's commonly known as the Lord's Prayer. And we can read of this in Luke chapter 11, verse 2. Jesus said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. So this little simple prayer that is uttered across churches across the world indicates that Jesus asked his disciples to pray for a coming kingdom upon the earth. That's what the world is coming to, the kingdom of God to be established upon the earth. Well, why should we take note of any of this? Surely the Bible's just a book, a catalogue of history of uh, the nations recorded by uh, various men and women. Well, that's not what the Bible declares itself to be. Whether you accept it or reject it, the Bible declares that it is God's message to his creation. The Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete. It's, it's everything we need to know about how God is dealing with the earth and how he wants his creation to respond. The epistle of Peter also declares that we can't just read the Bible and have our own interpretation of it as, as a clear plan of how it's set out and the things that God wants us to understand. He says that no prophecy of scripture is any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible declares that it is God's word that was given to men and recorded that subsequent generations might read and understand his plan and purpose. It's not a random series of events, but it has a specific purpose in prophecy to describe the coming of his kingdom upon the earth. I'll put a quote there from Amos uh, and chapter 3. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. There's a plan, there's a purpose, there's an unfolding of God's purpose with the earth declared in the pages of scripture so accept it or reject it you have to make that choice but that's what it declares now right from the beginning of the gospels when the angel gabriel appears to mary and declares that she is to have a child called jesus it comes with this promise that jesus is to be the king of this future kingdom Look at luke chapter 1 and verse 31 Behold, you, Mary, will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and we call the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. There are very important principles established in those few verses. Jesus was to be the Son of God. He was born of Mary, yes, but he was to be God's Son. 
he was to be given the throne of his father David. Now David was one of the great, 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 great grandfathers of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a king that lived uh, about 1500 BC. Uh, he uh, ruled in Jerusalem. He sat upon a physical throne and he ruled the nation of Jacob, the house of Jacob, uh, another name for Israel. There's something very important about this kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that has no end. That's what Angel Gabriel declared uh, to Mary. But Jesus came and preached the gospel and he did many miracles and signs and wonders. He was taken, he was crucified and he was raised uh, from the dead. And when we introduce to the start of the Acts of the Apostles, we see how that the Lord Jesus ascends to heaven. And that might be the end of the story. But the Acts of the Apostles, in chapter 1 and verse 10, uh, records that as the disciples saw Jesus ascending to heaven, there were two uh, figures that stood by and made this incredible declaration. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The Lord's gone, yes, he's ascended to heaven, but he's coming back. Because this promise of him sitting on the throne of his father David cannot be fulfilled unless he comes back to the earth. That's what it declares. Well, Jesus spoke often to his disciples about the prospect of him ruling as a king and the prospect of a kingdom to come. A particular instance in Matthew chapter 24, it's called the Mount Olivet Prophecy, or that's how it's generally known. The disciples were keen to know, when will this happen? Tell us, they said, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? How are they to recognise the coming of the kingdom of God? And so he declared it to them, that there would be signs in the physical world and the political world. And in the first instance, the Lord Jesus is coming, talking about uh, the coming end of the Jewish order of things. In AD 70, the temple would be destroyed by the Romans and the Jewish world would be turned upside down. Literally, the physical stones of the temple would be thrown down into the street. And you can go to Jerusalem and go and see this. Jesus had spoken about this. He prophesied of it, and that kingdom would to be overturned. But he also talked of what appears to be future events. He says in Mark's Gospel, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be earthquakes in diverse places. The stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers of heaven shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Watch therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, lest coming suddenly he findeth you sleeping. And so he encourages them to, to look, to see these events unfolding, and to be ready and prepared. <coughs> so yes, in the first instance, Jerusalem would be compassed with armies, as Luke's Gospel says, and the temple would be destroyed. But there were further signs and wonders that would herald the return of the Lord Jesus. This account appears in both Mark's Gospel, Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. And the detail that's put there for us is quite marked. Luke says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars. Now these symbols are used to describe the political heavens not just the physical heavens. The sun and the moon and the stars, distress of nations with perplexity. And as we put on the screen there, perplexity means no way out. Men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So if we're looking for this promised kingdom to come, and we're looking for the return of the Lord Jesus, it's heralded by incredible events happening in the earth. Now, we know that there have been 
some incredible events happening in the earth over uh, the last few years. It seems that every time we turn the television on or listen to the radio or look at the internet news, something <coughs> significant appears to be happening. Earthquakes, devastating tsunamis, the thinning ice pack, the desertification of great swathes of the equator where crops just won't grow anymore, forest fires in places like Canada, volcanic activity, storms, flooding. Don't take my word for it. The very leaders of the world are concerned about it. In 2015, at the end of the year, there was what was known as the Paris Accord. The leaders of the world gathered together to discuss uh, a paper that was produced by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Look at the language that they used to describe the urgency of what's happening in the earth. President Hollande said, the future of the planet is at stake. Obama said, we must act now, it's almost too late. David Cameron said, the earth is in peril. Jean-Claude Juncker says, we would need at least four planets to maintain our current way of producing, living and consuming. We only have one. So the leaders of the earth recognise that it is in trouble. That the increase in global temperature above pre-industrial levels appears to coincide with what man is doing to the earth. Now, this paper that was produced, it's called the Fifth Assessment Report, AR5, was produced in 2014. That's what they were responding to. And this is the language that it talks of. It talks of the problems of an increase in global temperature. It says, without additional mitigation efforts beyond those in place today, and even with adaptation, warming by the end of the 21st century will lead to high to very high risk of severe, widespread and irreversible impacts globally. The risks associated with temperatures at or above 4 degrees C include substantial species extinction, global and regional food insecurity, consequential constraints on common human activities, and limited potential for adaptation in some cases. This is perplexity. These are problems that are so insurmountable, there's no way out. So the nations are trying to grapple with how to deal with such incredible things happening in the earth. Not everybody believes it. This is one of Donald Trump's famous tweets. The concept of global warming, he says, was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. It's just a myth. It's just, it's just business. And so, in the G20 summit over the last few days, he's completely isolated because he's pulled America out of the Paris Accord. <coughs> the other nations have criticised America heavily. Stephen Hawking, the uh, influential scientist, says that in doing this, America is putting the nation and the, the countries at peril. The danger is that the Earth will become like Venus with temperatures of 250 degrees and just be inhospitable to life at all. He's talking about the need to uh, move to other planets to survive. He doesn't believe that man will survive on the earth. This is the language of the leaders of the world. And yet the Bible is saying that we're to look for a time of perplexity when there's great distress upon the earth that herald the coming of the Lord Jesus. Jesus talks about Earthquakes in diverse places. You can go on the internet, type it in, earthquakes, volcanoes, discovery.com, and you can see all those dots of volcanic and earthquake activity currently in the world. It's just a snapshot at a single point in time. The world is on the move. It appears to be changing. It seems to be responding almost to the political upheaval of man's life upon the world. Have a look at the US Geological Survey and see the earthquakes that are currently happening. All them, you see the, these are the tectonic plates. And you can see all along them, these movements of the Earth. 144 earthquakes of magnitude 6 or above in the last 12 months. 
in the last 15 years, 12 years have included more than the average number of earthquakes above uh, the, the principle. Uh, the table here, if you want to look at the notes afterwards, uh, gives you a list of the seismic activity by uh, the scale and then the number of occurrences in the last 15 years. 12 of the last 15 years have exceeded all of those averages. The Earth is indeed on the move. Jesus talks about wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, he says in Matthew 24. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, he says. The word there for sorrow is the Greek word Odin. It's the word that's used to describe the pangs of childbirth, when the contractions herald the birth of a child. And what Jesus is saying to us is when these events come again and again and again and they appear to have a momentum where they're coming closer and closer together, it heralds the coming of the Lord Jesus and God's kingdom upon the earth. There's a grainy black and white photograph of the First World War. On the 1st of July 1916, 18,000 men were killed in one day at the Battle of the Somme. It was declared to be the war that would end all wars. A machine war for the first time. And it was so terrible that the nations decided it couldn't possibly happen again. But yet, of course, it did. The Second World War came hard upon its heels. Wars and rumours of wars. And we're experiencing all those different types, aren't we? The West meddling in the Arab world, destabilising it, trying to produce democracy that wasn't wanted, creating chaos. Four million displaced people, chemical weapons, <coughs> civilians just as much of a target, the human shield, child soldiers, the rise of ISIS. We're familiar with these things. Just this week, the missile that's fired from Korea can now reach the shores of America. There is fear amongst the nations of the things that is happening in the earth. All these are the beginnings of sorrow, says the Lord Jesus. Wars, rumours of wars, famine and pestilence. We've seen the new war, the war on terror, followed by terror itself in our high streets. 22 dead, 59 hurt in a suicide bombing in Manchester. And terrible that those events are, they're nothing compared with the thousands who have died in Syria, Iraq, <coughs> Afghanistan. 50 million people at risk of starvation in Sudan. You try and plant the crops, but a civil war means you can't reap them. You have to flee. You live in a refugee camp. <coughs> The camps are attacked. This is a different kind of warfare, isn't it, that we're experiencing? And it's coupled with disease. Ebola, yellow fever, HIV, the Zika virus. We now experience viruses that are becoming drug resistant. Again, only this week, there was an article on the news about uh, a particular disease that uh, people have picked up in the world uh, recently where... There's no cure. The, the medication just doesn't work. This is the changing world that we're living in. The Bible tries to present a contrast between the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God. And it's very uh, carefully illustrated by these two pictures. The prophecy of Isaiah talks about man's wickedness in the earth. How that it, it's like a troubled sea in all its energy uh, dragging up the mire and dirt from the seabed. And the contrast that's presented to us in Revelation 15 verse 2 is the kingdom of God like a sea of glass mingled with the fire of the judgment of the Lord God. Total calm. That's what he's presenting to us. 
the sea and the waves roaring used to symbolise political as well as physical upheaval. Revelation uh, 17 and verse 15 describes that the waters in this symbolic book describe peoples, multitudes, nations and tongues. They're symbols of political events. So it's no surprise then that the newspapers use the same language to describe the events that we're seeing. The election of Donald Trump. Who'd have thought when he appeared in a Simpsons cartoon as the president of America that it would actually happen? The Brexit earthquake. And the night before, there were 7,000 lightning strikes over London and terrible storms and flooding. The papers report uh, the vote as of the Brexit earthquake, the vote that shook the world. The same language that the scripture uses to describe political upheaval in man's affairs. But you might say, well, we've always had these things. We've always had wars and we've always had civil wars and we've had famines and pestilences. We've always had these things. It's just fables. Well, that's what the Apostle Peter takes up in uh, one of his epistles, where the scoffer says, well, since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. It's, it's business as usual. It's just the same. But he reminds us that God has intervened in the past before in man's world. And he takes us back to Noah and the flood. And we see these fluffy pictures, don't we, that we see as a child of the ark and all the animals. And it's all green and lovely, rainbow in the sky. And we forget sometimes that it's an instance where God intervened in the world in an absolutely devastating way. And that same power, says Peter, has been held in store for the coming of the Lord Jesus, where God will intervene in man's affairs once more. The principle of Noah and the flood is used both in the Old and New Testament to typify the generation that experiences that time just before the coming of the Lord Jesus. Well, what was it like in the time of Noah? Well, Matthew 24 records it for us. Verse 36 says, But of that day and hour... No one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So if we go back and look at Noah in Genesis, look at the times in which he lived, we can see the warning signs that herald the coming of the Lord Jesus. Well, what was it like? Verse 38. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Largely it's a time of ignorance and disinterest in the purpose of God. It's business as usual. Eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. A carefree life without a thought for God's intervention, his impending judgment of the earth, and the establishment of his kingdom. Luke's Gospel continues, Likewise as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. God will intervene. But men and women are just going about their usual business with no regard for God. We can also get an insight from Genesis chapter 6 of the times before the flood. When the Lord God saw, he says, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. He was grieved in his heart. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. We have to look at many films, books, computer games, to see that man loves violence, that every imagination of man's thinking can be turned to wickedness, 
to the very opposite principles of righteousness that the Bible calls men and women to observe and to follow God's laws and commandments. That's what heralds the coming of the Lord Jesus, an age where these things are prevalent. Paul, writing to Timothy, talks about how that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Every Monday morning, Sister Sophie and I switch the news on before we go to work, and there's a report of somebody else that's been killed, they've been stabbed in the street, and they're dead. It doesn't make the main news anymore. It's just something that happens. People go out for a, a Saturday night out or a Sunday night out. Uh, they drink themselves silly. They get into a fight and they die. This is the world we live in. A pursuit of a hedonistic lifestyle. But no call to the pursuit of godly principles. Loves of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, some churches teach that, yes, Jesus has come back, but God's going to destroy the earth. It's all going to be burnt up in fire. That's not what the Bible teaches. When Noah and his family were saved in that ark, the Lord declared and set his bow in the cloud as a reminder that he wouldn't destroy the earth again for man's sake. Yes, God will intervene, but he's not intervening to destroy the earth. His whole purpose is that the earth is to be filled with the knowledge of his glory and that men and women recognise him as the creator of all heaven and earth. And that's his promise. He doesn't want to destroy the earth. He doesn't want men and women to die. He would rather that all men would repent. He won't destroy the earth for man's sake, but he will intervene. And that principle of Noah being saved by water is used in the New Testament to describe the principle of baptism. Baptism as full immersion in water. It's about a, a symbolic burial in water to be associated with the death and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. He says in the first epistle of Peter, chapter 3, it's not like taking a bath. It's not about getting dirt off the body. But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. And so uh, to be joined to the promises of life eternal in God's kingdom and sharing of this glorious opportunity, we are called to the pages of scripture to be baptised into the saving name of the Lord Jesus, to have our sins forgiven, and like Noah, to emerge on a new day as followers of the Lord Jesus. If you come to this hall week by week, sometimes on Sunday evening, sometimes in Bible class, you will see that the Bible reveals that there is a, a principled plan that has a time scale. We can read of prophecies like Daniel chapter 2, where Nebuchadnezzar dreams this fantastic dream of uh, this image made of all these metals. And it appears quite complicated, but if we go through that and look at those uh, materials that are used, the principle that is set forward is that the... Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was this head of this image, and his kingdom would be superseded by the kingdoms of the Medes and the Persians. And that kingdom itself would be superseded by the Greeks and the Romans, till we come to a point in history where there are strong nations and weak nations. And in the time of those kings, the Lord God shows his intervention. It's symbolised by a stone striking the feet of the image of the kingdoms of men and destroying it, and grinding it to powder, and then that kingdom filling the whole earth. Acts chapter 17, verse 30 says, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. The Bible promises that Jesus will come back to the earth to overturn the kingdoms of men, to claim his rightful throne and to rule in righteousness from Jerusalem.
there are lots of prophecies. Zechariah, Daniel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Revelation, that talk about a confederacy of nations that will gather against Jerusalem in the land of Israel. And there will be a, a terrible battle there. It's styled Armageddon. And at that time, the Lord God will intervene in the affairs of mankind. And there will be a great earthquake. The map here just shows the fault lines that go through the African plate, uh, the uh, Asian plate, and the European plate. And at this point, right in the heart of this little nation of Israel, the Lord's feet will stand, and the Mount of Olives will split, and a plain will be uh, created that there's a very large valley. The land itself will move to the north and to the south to create a plateau for the temple of the Lord God to be established in Jerusalem, that all nations might come and worship the Lord God as king over all the earth. It shall come to pass, says Zechariah, that everyone who is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord God of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It will be a reminder that the Lord God has intervened to rescue his people Israel and to overturn the armies of the nations that come against them. That he might establish a principle of rulership and authority in teaching his word to all the nations. Remember we read about Jesus that his kingdom was to be an everlasting kingdom. It won't be like the kingdoms of men. It will continue forever, he says. And only one man has the wisdom and authority to resolve the world's problems. We read from Psalm 72 as our introductory reading. It talks about a king ruling in righteousness. A king uh, judging with poor, with the, the poor and equity for uh, the poor of the earth. With justice, bringing peace to the earth. That he will champion the needy. And break in pieces the oppressor. It describes him having dominion from sea to sea. From the river to the ends of the earth. It starts locally in Jerusalem. But it will be a kingdom that spans the whole earth. All kings shall fall down before him. All nations shall serve him. It will be unlike anything else we've seen before. The nations have tried to bring peace. You can go to New York and you can go to the uh, buildings of the United Nations and you can see a quote from Micah and from Isaiah uh, carved into the stone walls and images from the scripture describing about the prospect of men beating their swords into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks, destroying the weapons of war and creating them as agricultural implements. Yet for all its noble intentions... The United Nations have been powerless to bring peace. Continually, man creates war. And for all the sanctions that seem to hurt the poorest of the world, the leaders seem determined for war. What's needed is what Isaiah 65 declares. A new heavens and a new earth. The physical world will change following the rulership of the Lord Jesus. Isaiah 11 verse 6 talks about the wolf and the lamb dwelling together, the lion eating straw like the ox, the deserts blossoming forth as the rose, springs of waters appearing in them, the lame man leaping, the deaf hearing, the blind seeing. Somebody that dies as a, at a hundred years old will be considered merely a child. A handful of corn upon the tops of the mountains we read in, in Psalm 72. This is the consequence of righteous rule in the earth when the Lord comes to claim his throne. Peace and prosperity and plenty. Micah says it's like every man sitting under his vine and under his fig tree, no one making him afraid. It's like a restoration of the Garden of Eden as it was at the beginning when man's wickedness is put down. And the principles of righteousness and godliness are established in the earth. 
and ultimately the purpose of a thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ is to bring death itself to an end. Paul writing in the first epistle to the Corinthians in chapter 15 talks about how that since by man came death by man also came the resurrection of the dead for as in Adam all die even so in Christ shall all be made alive. As natural descendants of Adam, because of our sinfulness, our disobedience to God's law, we, like Adam, were condemned to return to the dust. But if we're baptised into the saving name of the Lord Jesus, we change allegiance. We move from being in Adam to in Christ and associated with his resurrection. And the promise is that when Christ comes back to the earth, The dead will be raised. There will be a judgment and depending on how we've conducted our lives before our God and our determination to follow his laws and principles, then our physical bodies will be changed. That we might live forever in God's kingdom. No longer subject to flesh and blood and to the principle of death. And at the end of the thousand years, after the second resurrection that Revelation talks about, death itself will be destroyed. It will be removed completely. And the time is described as God wiping away all tears from men's eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. What well, can we trust God Can we believe these things that seem so fantastical, that might be declared as fables? Well, there's lots of proof. Again, come to this hall uh, and listen to some lectures about the miracle of the survival of the Jews, God's people. How they were scattered across the world, persecuted in every generation, in every nation, and ultimately drawn back after thousands of years of dispersion to the very land that was promised to them in the time of Abraham. We can read about Bible archaeology, the physical stones that declare the house of David as a real person who existed in a real place that gives us confidence that this throne that was declared to be uh, given to the Lord Jesus really existed. We can look at Bible prophecies about Egypt, Tyre, Babylon, Assyria, And see how God dealt with those nations in the past. And how the prophecies about those nations came true in a record of history. And if we look at those things and see those proofs established in history, it gives us confidence and certainty for the promises that God has made about the future. Let's not despair. What is the world coming to? The answer that the world is coming to the kingdom of God upon the earth. We hope that you'll consider these things further. Look into the pages of scripture and be comforted and decide that you too might be baptised into the saving name of the Lord Jesus. That when he comes and that call of the resurrection comes, you might even have life eternal in the kingdom of God upon the earth in a glorious time of peace and safety.